All right, uh, John chapter six. This is lesson 14 in our series, Jesus the God-Man, the study of Jesus in the book of John, line by line, chapter by chapter. Since we're starting in the middle of a, a chapter, we need to kind of set the scene of what has taken place so far. So we'll do a, re a real quick review here. So what, ha what has happened so far in this, in this section that we're studying? Well, Jesus has returned from Jerusalem and He's in the northern region of Galilee in His adult hometown of Capernaum on the shore of the Sea of uh, Galilee. During this time, uh, we've seen that He's performed two powerful miracles. One, a public miracle, the feeding of the 5,000 or 5,000 plus anyways. And the other one, a private miracle, walking on water uh, to meet His apostles in the boat. So a public miracle, private miracle. Uh, these two miracles set into motion a dialogue between the people and the Lord as they met subsequently in the synagogue at Capernaum. At first, the people want Him to be their king. Why not? Why not have Him as their king? He provides free food, He heals. You know, let's have this guy as king. But Jesus, knowing that their desire is only based on physical and spiritual reasons, rejects that notion out of hand. Doesn't even let that thing get started. After His refusal, Jesus takes the opportunity to declare His true identity, which has no relationship to an earthly king. Nothing like an earthly king at all. And of course, this is confusing to the people. So in various ways, He reveals His divine nature to them. Uh, he says He's the Messiah in verse 14. Verse 27, the Son of Man. Uh, verse 29, that He is sent by the Father. Um, uh, in verse 32, that He is the Son of God. In verse 33, that He gives life to the world. Verse 35, that He is the bread of life. So think about that for a second. If anyone said this about themselves, who do you think they would be? I mean, there's, there's just, you know, deductive reasoning. If a person says they're the Messiah, the Son of God, the Lord, you know, the only conclusion you can come to that at least what he's saying about himself is that he is, that he is divine. And so another point, another, you know, activity, another review point. Uh, these declarations along with the miracles are rejected by the people. Not only does He do miracles, He also declares His, you know, His true identity in the ways that I mentioned before and still the people uh, reject Him. They want more proof. They want more miracles. And of course, Jesus refuses to give them more proof. Instead, He makes two promises to those who choose to believe in Him based on the proof that He's already given them. And the two promises are that whoever they are, they will be accepted by God if they come to Him. That's one promise. Doesn't sound like much as a, as a promise, but when you think about that time where the privileged few were the ones who were accepted by God. Here, Jesus is saying, whoever you are, you, if you come to me, you'll be accepted by, by God. Even in our day, sometimes, you know, when I study with people, uh, they often say, well, I'm not worthy to become a Christian, or I'm not good enough yet to become a Christian. And you know, I tell them, well, you'll never be good enough to be a Christian. That's the whole point of the gospel. Everyone is welcome. And then the second promise he makes to those who believe, and he's saying this to the ones who rejected him, okay, you people rejected me, but the ones who come to me, I'll accept them, whoever they are, and you will have eternal life. So this is pretty much where we left off last time we had our study, but this isn't the end of the dialogue that Jesus is having with these people at Capernaum. Jesus has made two promises to the ones who believe, but in doing so, he's also stating without words something to those who persist in disbelief. He's saying something to those who disbelieve. By speaking to those who believe, he's saying something to those who disbelieve. 
and he's saying, if believing brings one acceptance from God and eternal life with Him, then the opposite will also happen. Those who disbelieve will not be accepted, will not receive the eternal life. Now, we continue this week uh, with the crowd's response to his promise to believers. So remember, this is a dialogue. He's talking to them, they're talking to him. And John is recording this dialogue that took place in that place. All right, so chapter six, beginning in verse uh, 49. So um, in verse, uh, excuse me, verse 41 rather. So let's see the crowd's reaction to his claims and his promises. It says, therefore the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down um, out of heaven. And so note that they don't talk about the promises. Nothing said about the promises. But finally they begin to grasp what he is saying that He comes from heaven. All of a sudden, the little glimmer you know, is, is starting to penetrate. Their reaction is to compare what they have seen and heard from Him to what they know about Him. In other words, they know He's a man. He never denies that He's a man. And they don't want Him, you know, uh, another, not, not that they don't want him, but they themselves don't want to go any further. In other words, what they know about him, he's a human being. And he is saying, I'm more than a human being, but they, they won't go further than that. Notice that they don't discuss the miracle, they don't discuss the promises, they simply allow their disbelief to grow into anger. And so now Jesus responds to their anger. Verse uh, 42, they were saying, is not this Jesus the son of uh, Joseph? Let me just read it out of my... Uh, they were saying, is, the, is this not Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come, uh, I have come down um, out of heaven? 43, and Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. So they've lost focus here and are now grumbling and rising in anger. They're not paying attention to him. He gets their attention back by telling them to stop. Stop whining, stop grumbling. In verse 44, it says, no, or he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. So their problem is that they're trying to figure out in a logical, physical way how Jesus came from heaven and they can't. They can't figure it out you know, mechanically, logically. How does that happen? So they're frustrated, they're angry. Have you never worked on a math problem and you just can't get it? Never mind a math problem, you're trying to get a screw out with a flat screwdriver and you strip it, you know? So in their brain, they're trying to figure out how does a man, especially a guy we know, he grew up here, we know his brother, his sisters, his mother, we know them, you know, how does he come out of heaven? <laughs> so Jesus tells them that logic and rationalization can't figure this thing out. Boy, is that a message to the world? Is that a message to the world? You can only believe it in order, you know, coming to Jesus is believing it. And you can only understand it or believe it through the method that the Father has prescribed. And that method is faith. What does the Hebrew writer say? We believe by faith that the world was created from nothing. You know, that, that, that statement will not get onto PBS or Nova. It won't get on to you know, museums where they showed six billion years ago and Christians don't have to explain the mechanics of the creation of the world like evolution, evolutionists do. Why? Now we can read about it. God has given us a, a kind of a general you know, a general understanding. But he's also told us 
this thing, you know, how, the, how the whole world was made. You don't have to figure it out logically. You believe it. This thing about God becoming a man, how does God inhabit a human form? I mean, how does that work? You don't have to figure it out physiologically. You believe it. That's the way you, that's the way you internalize this idea. So the father is, uh, excuse me, this is what he means by the father drawing them. Some people see this passage as a proof text for predestination. You know, uh, uh, they see this as, oh, you see God only calls several. But no, that's just an expression that means coming to God by faith. You know, uh, apprehending something through the process of faith. That's how God draws us, isn't it? That's how God draws, I mean, from the beginning of the Bible to the end, it's always how God works, doesn't He? He shows us something, tells us something, we believe it. That's how He draws us to Him, through faith. So the Father is the one who did the miracle through Jesus so that they would believe. In other words, they would draw near, they would accept Jesus and His claims. Now, believing doesn't mean you always understand how things are done. Believing means you accept as true the person or the thing that God points to through a teaching or a revelation or a miracle. That's believing. It doesn't mean you don't use your brain. Of course we have to use our brain when we read the Bible to understand the context, who Abraham is, who Moses is, you know, who Jesus is, the Jews. Of course, there, there's reasoning and there's understanding that, that, that goes on in order to set up the context, the backdrop, but the actual thing that happens, the miracle that God becomes man, that, that's not through logic. That's through faith that we, accept, that we accept that. So we often make that mistake just because we use human reasoning and intelligence to kind of you know, work our way through the printed page you know, and to understand the names and the, where things happen and the order in which things happen. Of course, we use that brain. But when it comes to the message itself, no, that's apprehended through faith, not through logic. You don't come to Jesus by logic. You're drawn to Him by God through the Word. Those who come in this way, Jesus says, will receive the promise. Verse 45 says the following, and it is, and it is written in the prophets, uh, and is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So Jesus goes to the scriptures themselves to convince them that what he proposes, this is not a new method. This is not some new fangled religion that Jesus is bringing to the people. He said, no, no, no. This has always been the way that you come to God, always, from day one. I hear, I've heard people teach, in the Old Testament we had you know, the law and that's, that's how you came to God. And in the New Testament now we have a new thing called faith. Wrong, absolutely wrong. It's always been by faith, always. You know, we could get into a big long discussion about the law, but basically the law was given two reasons. One, to help define a certain people, the Jews, and two, to mitigate the evil in the world. Well, three perhaps, to prepare us for the coming of Jesus and the understanding of the gospel. So that being drawn by a person's believing in his word, this is nothing new. The prophets wrote about this, Jesus says. The quote he refers to is from the prophet Isaiah, who was referring to God's blessings on special people. And these people were special because they believed the word that they had been taught. And because of that, they received blessings. That's what Isaiah is talking about. And Jesus is saying, the same thing's going to happen to you if you believe. There will be blessings for you. You will be accepted, whoever you are, and you will receive eternal life. That's the blessing that comes with believing. So belief in Christ is the way to separate those who belong to God from those who don't. And we have so many efforts in the world today to blur that line. To say, well, you know, people who don't believe in God or don't believe in Christ specifically, that doesn't mean that they're bad people. No, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily evil people or criminals or whatever. It just means they don't get the promises. 
They have access to the blessings in this life, food, children, family, you know, the satisfaction that comes from work and so on. God you know, allows them those blessings, but they don't get those two promises. Acceptability from God and eternal life. Those only come to those who believe in Christ. So this causes a lot of hard feelings, but this is what Jesus taught. This is offensive to other religious groups and non-religious people, but it is what Jesus Himself taught. I, I love when, well, I don't love it, but it makes me smile in a sad kind of way when people say, oh, Jesus didn't, you know, Jesus didn't Himself reject uh, the Muslims or the Hindus. You know, Jesus loves everybody. Of course He loves everybody, but remember the promise that He said. The promise only goes to those who believe in Him. You know, I tell people, hey, don't, don't be mad at me because I've shown you what the scriptures say. Your, your beef is with God, not me. I have to tell you, if it was up to me, you know, the kind of person I am, boy, I don't want anybody to suffer, I don't want anybody to get hurt, you know what I'm saying? I'd probably you know, fudge, well, I'll let them into it. But my job is not to determine where the line is. My job is to accurately convey what the word says. You have to deal with that. We all have to. So I can understand non-Christians having trouble with this idea and calling us all kinds of names because of it. This is normal. It was happening then. What I don't understand is Christians who falsely teach that God accepts all sincere religions. That's the hard part. I don't know why. They're not reading the same Bible I am. If you want to be a universalist, that's fine. But don't pervert the basic, don't call yourself a Christian. You can be a universalist. There are churches that are called church, universalist churches, and that's what they teach. Everybody's in. Everybody's in. But the New Testament doesn't teach that. Jesus taught that only His disciples were accepted by God and received eternal life, and they hated Him for it. So don't be you know, don't expect to be treated much differently and don't change the Lord's word. All right, verse 46, enough preaching. Verse 46, not that, anyone has, not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. So there's no one who has seen or been taught directly by God and what Jesus is meaning is in His presence. No one has been in the presence of God. This privilege belongs to only one person and by implication Jesus is referring to Himself. He's already said that He is the one who comes from heaven. And the reason He says that is to reinforce what He's just said. Because in their minds they're saying, man, what gives you the right to say this? Who said you, you know, who made you God all of a sudden? Who made you the judge to draw the line? So without that being said, Jesus even answers and says, the one who's already been in the presence of God, he's the one who can put that line there. So the Lord re-summarizes his argument here by inferring that since they have not seen God, they should therefore believe the words of one who has seen God and in doing so demonstrate that they are truly God's people. Okay, verse 47 to 50, let's read on. Truly, truly I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and uh, they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not, and not die. So in continuing his response to them, he repeats the promises and claims that he has already made previously. So you notice the way the dialogue is working. They say something, he answers them, the, the thing that they say, actually say, he answers them, then he answers the things that, that they're thinking. <laughs> and then he challenges them, challenges them again with something else. This is the something else. So in continuing his response, he repeats the promises that the one who believes in him has eternal life, that he is the bread of life, that he is superior to Moses and what he offers is superior to what their forefathers received through Moses. So what happened through Moses? Well, through Moses, God offered the people physical food to satisfy their hunger and prolong their lives for a short time in a difficult environment, the manna that they received from God while they were in the desert. Jesus compares that miracle 
to what is happening now, what he's offering now. He's saying through Jesus, God offers spiritual food which will nourish the soul and which will ultimately lead to eternal life. You know, he's saying to them, which do you want? Do you want miraculously made food that will simply fill your belly and keep you going for another couple of years? Or do you want the spiritual food that will give you eternal life? Make up your mind. Verse 51. Jesus says, uh, excuse me, uh, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone, if anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also, which I will give for the life of the world, is my flesh. Oh, man alive. Now he's gone and done it. Now he's gone and done it. Once again, Jesus calls on them to believe. Before he had asked them to believe that he was divine and from God by using kind of symbolic language, you know, the bread of life coming down from heaven, it's all different ways of saying the same thing. Now he explains how the spiritual food that produces eternal life is actually given. One must eat the bread of heaven. In other words, the bread of heaven has to get inside of you. You have to internalize it. And he's, he's doing a play on you know, bread. You have ordinary bread. How do you get it inside of it? Well, you eat it. You know? Can you describe what eating is? Yeah, you put it in your mouth, you chew it, you swallow it, it goes into your stomach, and so on and so forth. So he's saying, okay, you want eternal life, then you have to eat. You have, a, you have to internalize the spiritual bread. So this is, a, this is a symbolic way of saying, you must take me inside of you through faith, through faith. He also explains in, in veiled terms just how he will gain life for the world by giving his body, in other, in other words, by giving his life for the world. Of course, he's referring to the cross that he's going to die on, but it's, all, it's a very veiled reference to these people. Why? They're not believers. They're not believers. You, know, you believe, he gives you more. You keep on believing, he gives you more. You keep on believing, he gives you more. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. You, know, you first, always you first. You take the first step, he'll give you more. You take another step, he'll give you more. He doesn't, he doesn't give you more until you take a step. And he's telling these people, you need to take a step. You believe in me, I'll give you more. And the more is more understanding, deeper knowledge. At this point, they cannot begin to understand the significance of what he's saying, but if they believe God's word in the prophets about a suffering Savior, remember he was quoting Isaiah, they knew Isaiah, and Isaiah talked about when the Messiah would come, what kind of Messiah, he'd be a suffering servant, he'd be one who'd take the sins of, of others on himself. They knew that, they studied those things. So now Jesus is actually explaining in ordinary terms that He's going to be doing that. I'm going to be given my life, hoping that they will make the connection. Because He's not just talking, he's, he's explaining how the scriptures that they knew were going to be fulfilled through Him and why. Um, for now, we see that Jesus has already laid out the basic elements of the gospel message to them. Belief that Jesus is the divine Son of God. Trust that His sacrifice saves us. Obedience to His teachings. All right, so now the response of the Jews. Remember, dialogue. Go to verse 52. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Remember, this is a conversation between Jesus and the people in the synagogue at Capernaum. In their response, we see that they missed the spiritual significance of what he said. They don't get it. And they don't get it because they didn't take the first step. Had they taken the first step to believe who he was, they would have got this but they didn't get it. Now remember, they're, they're judging everything he says from the perspective that he is only a man. Of course, as Jesus is only a man, they were right and they'd be foolish to follow him. But if the miracle is true and he is who he said he is, they're being foolish for rejecting the Son of God. <clears throat> so now Jesus calls on them to convert. In this section, the Lord declares openly in terms of salvation, calls on them to decide. What's he doing to this crowd? He's preaching the gospel to them. 
And when you preach the gospel, eventually, right? Remember I told you, you got to ask for the order. Now that I've explained everything to you, now that I've explained the gospel and how you're to respond and so on and so forth, what about it? You ready to go? You ready to decide? That's what Jesus is doing. Let's look, 53 to 55, we've got to move. It says, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, oh no, <laughs> never mind eat the flesh, now He adds drink the blood. You have no life in yourselves. <sighs> Is that still true today? Those who eat the flesh, drink the blood, they have no life. He who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true uh, drink. So belief in Jesus equals eternal life and resurrection. One who has no life, one has no life unless one does this. And Jesus is emphatic about it, there is no doubt. Note that he doesn't become exasperated or discouraged by their unbelief, he merely becomes more emphatic, clearer about the way to eternal life. The symbolic language merely repeats the same message. You must eat my flesh, drink my blood. In other words, you've got to internalize me through faith. Okay? That's the only way, no other way. Then in 56, 59, there's where I missed it here. Verse 56, he who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread, there we go. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Again, a kind of bookend. You know, John says they were at Capernaum, that's the front end, and now the bookend. He says they were, this is where they were. This, was not, this is not a composite of teachings from here and there, like uh, the Sermon on the Mount, for example. Many scholars have said that that's a composite of teachings altogether. But here John wants to make sure that the reader understands this is a dialogue that happened all at the same time in the same place with the same people. So in these verses, Jesus explains the dynamics of faith and how it produces life. The one who believes in me becomes, by virtue of faith, part of me, and I become part of him, and subsequently he receives all the life that I share with the Father because I also am united to the Father. In other words, you become part of Jesus and because He is part of God, you become part of God. Christianity is the only religion that has this idea. Some other religions have something like this, but none of them have this idea, that you become part of God. Now, the key here is not to try to be like the, uh, like Jesus by trying to understand how all of this can be so, as if Jesus was a mere human being and becoming part of Him could be explained in a physical way. Some, uh, <clears throat> some religions, especially some uh, uh, pagan religions, naturalist religions, they believe you know, if you eat you know, cannibalism, you know, cannibals, some tribes believe, you know, if you eat each other, you, you gain the power of that person, or a wolf, you, know, you kill a wolf and you wear the head, or the new Lone Ranger movie, you know, the guy with the crow on his head. You know, you, they think that they take on the spirit or the abilities of the animal or the individual. Well, that, that's, a, that's a perverted idea of here. This is the true idea. This is the pure idea. Internalizing Jesus through faith makes you part of Him. And because He is part of the Godhead, you also become part of the Godhead. That, that's such a, wow, you can't get all that in, into your mind. Excuse me. So Jesus is telling them to see this as an offer for a particular relationship with God through Him made possible by faith. By faith, we somehow become part of Jesus, the Son of God. By faith, He somehow becomes part of us. By faith, we are changed from physical, temporal beings into eternal, spiritual beings. 
Now, that faith that we're talking about is expressed in a physical way, but it itself is not the physical thing in, in its nature. So later on, we're going to learn that this faith has two physical expressions practiced by all who claim to believe. The first is baptism. It is at this point in time that through faith we become united with Jesus and He is united to us. What is it that makes us united to Jesus? Well, the Lord has explained, it's faith. But later on, and in other books, we find out how to express that faith. Not, not, not by killing another human being and eating part of it, or wearing animal skins, or you know, uh, uh, worshiping a rock or the moon. That's not the expression of faith that God is asking for. The expression of faith that He details for us is that we're united to Christ in baptism. Baptism is the historical moment when that spiritual thing takes place. It's a physical act, but at that moment we know by faith that His blood washes away our sins. You know, and I think in this class we're certainly familiar with that idea. Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16, Revelation 1.5. I mean, it's all throughout the New Testament. There's no actual physical cross or blood. Our sins are not actually visible. But during the physical act of baptism, we know that the invisible actions are taking place. Why? Because we believe God's word. That's why we know it through faith, like we know everything else. When you were baptized, anything happen there? Did the sky open up? Did, did? No. How did we know what was taking place took place? Through faith. We believed God's word when He said, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. How do you know you're saved? Well, I believe what it says. Acts 2.38, how do you know that all your sins were forgiven? All of them were forgiven. Well, because in Acts 2.38 it says, for the forgive, bapti be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. It didn't say for some of your sins, your, your venial sins, your mortal sins, your sins in the past. It says all of your sins are forgiven. So all of my sins are forgiven. And I know this how? Through faith. And then the other physical act, if you wish, is communion. This physical act, uh, through faith, connects us to Christ and every other believer. The Word of God tells us that these spiritual, invisible things are taking place during this very visible and physical act. By faith, we're united to the Lord and to the church as we practice this ceremony every, every Sunday. And so by direct declaration and prophecy of things to come concerning His cross, He's trying to reveal to these people the relationship between faith, salvation, and ultimately the key physical acts that accompany and express these things. So we see that even with all of this effort, the majority of His hearers were not ready to believe. It should be a lesson to us. If the Lord Himself, doing miracles, had trouble converting you know, people, Let's not be discouraged if you know, not everybody we share the gospel is ready to just, oh, I believe, where's the water? You know? I mean. All right, so some very important concepts here to learn. We have about five minutes left. Concept number one, you can only know Jesus by faith. You cannot know who Jesus is by human wisdom and knowledge alone. You can only know Him by faith. The only way to know, by faith. Faith is the key to spiritual knowledge and wisdom. First you believe, then your eyes are open to see and to know. So if you're wondering, you know, I, I, I need to move forward in my spiritual life, I need to grow in my spiritual life. Usually the problem is there's something there that you don't believe, or there's something there you have not affirmed your belief to or there's something there that you're still kind of struggling with, or you're still iffy on. So faith is the key to spiritual knowledge and wisdom. And then finally, genuine faith is expressed by converts through obedience in baptism. Genuine faith is expressed by Christians by faithfully taking the Lord's Supper. That's why, you know, uh, every other ceremony added to the Christian faith is unbiblical. 
parades, candles, statues, uh, whatever. You know, whatever you want to do. Uh, whatever ceremony, you, the, you know, some people say, why, why is the Church of Christ so minimalist? Your church buildings are rather plain. Your, your liturgy calendar is rather empty. You don't have the feast of this, you don't do that, you don't have the you know, whatever, you don't celebrate the Holy Spirit day, you, you don't have those things, why? Well, because as far as public ceremonies are concerned, there are only two that we've been given. One is baptism, where a convert, a believer, expresses his faith in a biblical way and is united to Christ, added to the church. The other, communion, where all believers demonstrate their faith in Christ and their unity with one another. Those are the only two things we've been given. Everything else has been added by human beings thinking, this is going to be a good idea. Hey, how about no meat on Friday? Wow, there's an idea. <laughs> so I'm not saying that people have evil intentions when they do things like this. But one thing I am happy about, one thing I am thankful for in the churches of Christ, that we have set ourselves the goal of simply following the New Testament in what it says. And it's, it's, I know it's a bit of a slogan sometimes, but we really are committed not to go beyond that. We don't go further than that. If we only have two public ceremonies, if you wish, then we stick to just those two public ceremonies. We don't add, we don't subtract, we don't embellish them. We just, we just do them the way the Bible gives us. And the elders are correct in resisting any other attempt to kind of ceremonialize anything else in our life, in our experience, and in our, our worship. Okay, that's it for this class. We'll keep on going. Next class, chapter 15. Thank you for your attention.